This is part two of an Anything Ghost Halloween. Carrying on now with the story from Leslie in East Point, Michigan. The Thing in the Window. I was about 11 years old. It was a school night and getting late. So my mom told my sister and I to get ready for bed. My sister ran off for the bathroom to brush her teeth, and I went to my room to put on my pajamas. My mom was in the attic that was remodeled into one large bedroom that I shared with my sister. At the top of the stairs was a single window. On the outside of that window, there weren't any trees or anything that would allow someone to get that window from the outside. As I walked up the stairs to change for bed, I walked past that window and went to my dresser to get my pajamas out. After I changed, I turned around to go back downstairs. I saw a black shadow. The only way I could describe it was like a gargoyle. It was about two to three feet tall. I screamed and started crying. My parents and my uncle, who was visiting, ran upstairs to see what was wrong. I told them what I had seen out the window. I was crying, scared, in disbelief of what I had seen. My dad and uncle ran outside because they thought maybe someone was trying to get into the window with a ladder, and they also looked all around the house and didn't see anyone or any ladder or any signs that a ladder had been under the window. I was too scared to sleep in my room that night, so my sister and I slept on the floor in my parents' room. I never saw the thing in the window after that. I really don't want to see it again. I've had a lot of spooky things happen to me and my family in my childhood home. I was glad to move out as soon as I did. Hey there, Lex, um, and anything ghost listeners. Uh, my name is Sarah. I um, live in North Carolina, but I'm native to Colorado. and. I'm going to tell you, I actually have quite a, quite a few stories. Um, it's been a weird life, but the stories I'm going to tell you about right now are the ones of, of people I didn't know personally, and I didn't um, actually see any of these uh, apparitions in person, but I definitely um, had an encounter. Um, When I was in high school, I was in drama, and our theater at our high school, everybody had always talked about that there was a ghost, that the ghost that had a name, that the ghost's name was Homer, and that the ghost frequented um, the shows that were being put on and would mess with the lights and the sound equipment and there would be footsteps people would hear behind them when they would be walking in the auditorium in the dark and backstage. We had a huge backstage area. Um, we had a, a really large stage and, and backstage area. And there was a lot of dark corners and, and places for people to uh, hang out. And, and we would have a, a good time hanging out while we were rehearsing for our shows and musical productions and whatnot. Um, we also had um, a costume room that was on a second floor up. So behind the stage, you would walk backstage and turn to the left, and there would be a long, dark, green-colored hallway. And at the end of that hallway was the girls' dressing room, and along the side of that hallway was the boys' dressing room. And at the front of the hallway was a long stairwell going up to the costume room which was this isolated dark (laughs) stairwell and when you got to the top there was just a small landing and then the door to the dark costume room well we talked about Homer frequently the tech um, the techies and the actors and and we all had a, a fun laugh talking about the stories we had heard secondhand, but nobody had ever really had a, a first-hand story of their own. 
but one day I uh, came off stage from rehearsing from a show. I went to the back into that long, dark corridor to the girls' dressing room, and there was nobody in there. It, you can see, because the three, three of the walls are mirrors, so you can see everybody who's in the room or who's not in the room. So when you're standing there, and I'm standing against the one wall that doesn't have a mirror, I can see that there's nobody in this room but me. And there are two racks of clothing, you know, like those rolling racks that costumers use to carry clothes with them places. And uh, one of the racks, I, I'm looking straight ahead at it, and all of a sudden I got this feeling, and I can see everything behind me and around me because of the mirrors, I got this awful feeling that everybody always talks about when they're in the presence of, of another entity. And it was like cold water being poured all down my head and my shoulders. And this, this awful trickling of, of fear just injected into me. And I'm feeling that there is somebody there. And I, my instinct was to run, but I couldn't. There immediately, this feeling take o took over me that was utter fear. And um, they always say fight or flight. Well, I, I don't really have either. I just have <laughs> frozen. And I was just frozen. And I looked up into the mirror, hoping to see an actual human person. And there was none to justify the feeling of a, of a person being nearby. And I felt a hand on my shoulder and it was like the grip of, of actual fingers, actual human fingers. But I'm looking in the mirror and there's no one there. The feeling was, was of, of a man's hand and it gripped my shoulder and then shoved me and shoved me just enough forward that I lost my balance and looking in front of me in that second I'm looking at one of those racks of clothing and it starts to lay down gently on its side not fall down or slip like one of the wheels on the bottom was rolling or anything it was as if somebody were holding the clothes and holding the rack and tipping it slowly onto its side and laying it flat on the ground. And the clothes did not fall or bend with the gravity. The clothes looked as if they were being held together by arms and slowly being lowered to the ground. And in this, I mean, the whole thing probably took about seven or eight seconds from the shove and watching what was happening in front of me, the clothing. And in that moment, I, I could feel a presence on my left shoulder, like a heavy person, like a person putting their body right up against me. And I finally was able to let out a scream and take off running. And I took off running back behind me, down the corridor, I don't even have a memory of actually running. All I remember is just the feeling of the, the wind against my face as I ran, I guess, and then landing somewhere in the middle of the stage in the middle of rehearsal and just crying and not having any other explanation except just to say Homer. That's all I could say was Homer. And it was, uh, yeah, it was absolutely 100% hand of God real thing that occurred. The following year, I was working with friends up in the costume room in that second level up the, that dark staircase and we were locking it up and it was the three of us and it, the, my two friends had never uh, heard, you know, Homer stories firsthand. They had only, of course, heard those stories secondhand stories and they weren't really impressed. So I started telling them about my personal story and 
my friend uh, said, I don't think so. And we shut the door and locked it. And we're standing on the top of the landing and there's a, a light bulb above our heads. And he said, all right, I'm done. I don't want to hear it anymore. He goes, there is no Homer. And at that second, crack, this loud cracking happened and the light above our head shattered and the light went out and we screamed. And I mean, once again, just our feet didn't even touch the steps, just flew down the stairs to the bottom and out onto the stage and out the door. We, we couldn't, uh, We couldn't even talk about it until we were (laughs) several feet away from the building itself that that had really happened. So there, there you go. I know that was very long to explain, but I I hope you enjoyed my ghost stories. I've been listening to the podcast for a long time. I adore listening to everybody's firsthand and secondhand accounts of this, uh, this world that exists right in the same world as us and all of these these um, really good stories that people have to share and and I love listening to them so thank you so much for sharing and I will definitely um, send in some more I I have a lot of a lot of other ones that are uh, some goodies some goodies so thank you so much for listening and uh, thank you Lex for compiling all these for everyone happy Halloween everybody and take care a story from Diane in Southern California Joshua Tree Halloween In the late 80s, I was working as a counselor for at-risk teenagers. For one of the activities, five counselors took a group of ten teenagers for four days and three nights of hiking, camping, reflection, and various other group activities to Joshua Tree National Park in the California desert. On the last night of our trip, All participants, teenagers, and adult counselors, included, were to sleep solo on the ground without a tent. The only items we could have were a sleeping bag, tarp, water, flashlight, and a whistle. The flashlight and whistle were safety precautions, in case someone had an emergency. Just after sunlight, the three guides escorted each participant at least a hundred yards away from each other, into the desert. I was taken to my spot and had no idea where I was. The guide had me test my whistle and my flashlight before he left me. By the light of the crescent moon, I watched him walk away. My heart was beating so fast. I was scared to be outside like that. I had never done anything like that before. I was all alone. I placed my tarp down on the ground, and I got into the sleeping bag and zipped it all the way up, only leaving my nose slightly exposed. I was so afraid of snakes and other creatures that may come up on me. I lay there, listening to the sound of the sand blowing across the sleeping bag. I must have fallen asleep, because I was suddenly awakened by a heavy weight on my body. I couldn't move. It felt like pressure as though someone was on top of me near my chest and upper arms. There was a sound like breathing as you would expect if someone was on top of you. I was able to get my whistle to my mouth, but I was too afraid of what this thing was doing and I was not able to blow it. I thought that maybe it was one of the teenagers playing a trick on me, so I yelled at them to get off of me and saying they would be in deep trouble tomorrow. The feeling of pressure lasted maybe 10 to 15 seconds and suddenly went away. I summoned the courage to unzip my sleeping bag, and while still laying there, I looked around. I could see no one. I didn't want to startle all the teens in the group, so I decided to tough it out. I zipped up the sleeping bag to my nose again and just lay there, unable to go back to sleep. I was lying there for what seemed like an eternity because I could not sleep. Suddenly, I 
felt as though someone picked me up and tossed me, but I landed very lightly. Now I was really freaking out, and I knew I had to unzip my sleeping bag to see if anyone was around. I unzipped my bag and sat up. The tarp was underneath my sleeping bag. But as I looked around in the moonlight, I saw approximately 30 to 40 feet away from me was the spot I had first laid down with my hiking shoes, water, and flashlight. I couldn't believe it. I was numb with shock and scared. I was still concerned about waking the other teenagers and the other guides. So, I walked back to the spot I originally placed to retrieve my items. No one was around. I got back into the sleeping bag, zipped myself back up, and waited until the guide picked me up in the morning. I never went back to sleep. The sun was up when the guide came to retrieve me. Back at the main campsite, all the teenagers and adults were walking in and chatting about the night. I discreetly told two other adult counselors about what had happened to me. They didn't believe me. They thought I was dreaming. I didn't tell the teenagers or anyone else until after the trip. It was later that evening when we returned to our main office where the teens were to be picked up by their parents. And I wanted to take a shower because that night happened to be Halloween and I was planning on attending a party. As I was drying myself off, I looked in the mirror and saw what appeared to be a bruise on each one of my arms by my shoulders. They looked like thumbprints, and I started freaking out. I quickly got dressed and searched for my colleague. I showed him my arms. Originally, he didn't believe me. At first, he thought, the bruises were caused by my heavy backpack. He had me try on my backpack to check. There was no evidence that the backpack could have caused those bruises. Needless to say, I did not go to the party because I was too shaken up. Instead, I went home to an empty house, continuing to go over and over in my mind about what I experienced. Hi, my name is Susan, and I'm an artist living in Indiana. I've had several experiences throughout my life, but the story I want to focus on today is probably my most traumatic one from my childhood. I grew up in a haunted house. It didn't make any sense for it to be haunted. It was a newer home. No one had ever heard of anything awful happening there, but it was located next to train tracks, and I have heard of bad things happening around train tracks, or maybe it's just the spirits were connected to the land itself. Either way, I was faced with the reality of the paranormal before I was old enough to even know that that's something that people questioned whether or not it even existed. As a little girl, I remember lying in bed and being up, woken up to the sounds of voices, laughter, and movement in what was our living room. Being a curious girl, I would get up thinking maybe that some of my parents' friends had stopped by and I was wondering who was there. I'd groggily walk up to the door, turn the knob and open it, and then nothing silence. Confused, maybe I just imagined it, maybe it's part of a dream, I don't know, I just go back to bed. Other nights I'd hear the TV on in the den. I'd get up and in our house you had to walk down the hall across the living room and then look around the wall to the right to see where the TV was in the den. Well, I'd walk all the way there hearing hushed TV sounds and I could swear I saw the glow of blue light just to turn the corner and nothing. TV is off, it's off, it's deathly quiet all around me, and the air just feels thick. I always thought something felt wrong and weird, but I was also a kid and thought this was super frustrating, getting up and seeing the same thing happening over and over again. I thought I was maybe just hearing things. I remember laying in bed one night, hearing the TV, and I was like, nope. I am not hearing that. It's my imagination. I am not walking out there again. No. And then it just kept getting louder and louder and louder till I flung back the covers, walked out there, and 
Nothing. Just thick silence. And then I'd hurry back to my bedroom and jump under the covers again. Darkness would also swirl above my bed. Sometimes it would stay around the perimeter of my room and I would keep the covers over my head and just pray it would go away. Then other nights, when I could tell it wanted my attention more, it would thicken and swirl above my bed. It's just my imagination, it's just my imagination, until it got to be too much and I just couldn't take it anymore. I'd muster up all my courage, throw back the blankets and run to my mom's room to sleep. I could feel it right behind me the whole way to my mom's room. There was a mirror at the end of the hall and I just knew instinctively not to look into it unless I wanted to see whatever was behind me. When I would get to her room, I could still feel it around us, waiting, but I was safe. The sounds of people visiting or the sound of the TV was pretty much a nightly thing. Sometimes I'd check, sometimes I didn't. Sometimes the darkness would come to my room and sometimes I got to rest peacefully. One night though, the darkness took things to a whole nother level. I was lying in bed, trying to sleep. The dark masses started swirling above my bed. It was thick. It was fast and it was terrifying. It got to a point where I couldn't take it anymore and I flung myself out of bed and ran for the door. But when I got there, there was no door. No door knob, no door frame, no bookcase, no toys, no light switch, no nothing. My hand kept sliding down a smooth wall, reaching for anything familiar and nothing that was supposed to be there was there. I just, I I ended up just sliding down the wall into the fetal position and started screaming until my mom burst in to see what was the matter. And as soon as she came in and flicked on the light, everything was back. The door, the bookcase, the toys, posters, all the junk that fills a little girl's room was back. We later moved out of that house. My brother had some crazy experiences there too, and we've shared a few stories together, but honestly, we rarely talk about that place now. I know for me, the terror is still very real. And I don't want to let it take up residence in my life now by me thinking about it a lot. One last detail that I would like to share about the house. Over the years, I did kind of start to wonder that maybe my imagination did get the best of me. I was a kid, and I started to question my own memories. And one day I was talking to my mom, and I started reminding her of all the experience that I'd had in that house. And she turns to me and just says, huh, Guess then that makes the fact that the people that bought the house from us taped up scriptures in all the windows. That really makes sense now, because that's a practice used to ward off evil spirits. So, looks like it wasn't a little girl's imagination after all. Thank you for letting me tell my story, and take care. This is a story from Dawn in Atlanta, Georgia. Sister's Ghost. My parents retired and decided to move from Dublin, Ireland to Florida. I was 18 years old, thought that it was a grand idea to go to a university on the beach, so I moved to the States with them. Keep in mind that I glow in the dark, so it's a bit funny that I would spend time at the beach, but at the time it sounded like a brilliant idea. It was during our initial year living in Florida that my mother relayed events in our home in Dublin from when I was a young child. My mother is a down-to-earth Irish woman who grew up in the Irish Depression and, despite being well-off late in life, she held on to the Depression-era mentality. She is the last person to spread wild, untrue stories. She waited years to tell this story for fear that it would make her look like a crank. When I was five years old, my sister, Sheila, was 18. I was very young, but Sheila was very close to me. She was ornery and individualistic. She wanted to study law enforcement and become a Garda, that is, the Irish police. The next oldest, Eileen, was constantly teased and terrorized by Sheila. Eileen was a wallflower, and it seemed everything she did annoyed Sheila. However, at only 18 years old, Sheila was killed by a drunk driver. It was a huge blow to the whole family. Six months after my sister died, things started to settle into what became our new normal. Sheila's bedroom was the largest bedroom. It was the tradition in our house 
that the oldest child was allowed to have the largest bedroom. Sheila moved into the bedroom when her older sister moved out, and my parents decided enough time had passed for Eileen to move into it now. After a few weeks, my parents noticed that Eileen was lethargic and was struggling with her activities. When they pressed her on the matter, she just said she wasn't sleeping well. My parents just chalked it up to her sleeping in a new room with strange creaks and angles. A few days later, Eileen came to my mother. She couldn't look her in the eyes, but told her that she could no longer sleep in the big bedroom. My mother asked her why not. Was it because of the newness or the strange noises it made? Eileen told her these things had nothing to do with her wish. She told my mother that she was frightened. Frightened of what? Mother asked. Mom, Sheila comes into my room every night and tells me to get out of her room. My mother was severely taken aback by this statement, and truly not what she expected to hear. She felt that her daughter was nervous in the new room and added that a combination of grief over her older sister's death and the guilt of not fully mourning a sibling she didn't fully like or get along with. And this all manifested with her seeing her dead sister appear in her dream that seemed so real. My mother talked it over with my father. My father was a high court judge in Dublin with a true kind heart. He went to great efforts to help those who came in front of him in his court. I spent many a Saturday in my youth on his weekly calls with him where he would fix things in people's homes, buy groceries, help people get jobs, and just talk to people. It hurt him so terribly to lose a child, and it saddened him to see the reactions of the other children. My mother insisted that it had just been bad dreams. She wanted to spend the night with Eileen in her room. She knew it would make her feel better, and together they would see through the night safely. When my mother informed Eileen, it was the happiest she had seen the young girl in two weeks. The two of them turned it into a slumber party with popcorn, and they read books aloud to each other. My mother managed to stay up past midnight, quietly reading to herself over an hour after Eileen nodded to slumber. But soon, my mother could no longer keep her eyes open and turned off the lamp and went to sleep. Mom, wake up! My mother awoke with the shake of her shoulder. She shook her head and opened her blurry eyes to a vision of Eileen sitting up in bed illuminated by a nightlight on her nightstand. What is it, love? She's here. What? Eileen moved closer to her mother's ear and whispered softly, Sheila's here. My mother sat up in bed and squinted in the dark. She could see someone standing there, just out of the range of the nightlight. Who's there? My mother asked. What are you doing here? The soft voice of the figure said. My mother turned on the lamp on the bedstand. She found herself staring at her daughter Sheila. But there was something very different about her. You're dead, my mother said. How can you be here? The room was silent. Sheila didn't respond. Both of you get out of my bleeding room now, Sheila said with an eerie declaration. My mother said years later in Florida, she remembers this so clearly, and this is exactly what was said by her dead daughter. It was the most frightening thing that had ever happened to her. My mother didn't think about it even for a minute. She gathered up Eileen and held her close as the two of them quickly left the room. In the doorway, my mother took one look back 
and saw the spirit of Sheila wasn't even looking back at them. Just ahead, at what was once her bed. The next day, my mother and father moved all of Eileen's things back into her old room. For five years, until Eileen was eighteen and got married and moved out, she never moved into the big room. Eileen moved out the day after her eighteenth birthday and never set foot in the house again. For those five years, the door to the room remained closed. I was told not to ever go in there. When I asked why Eileen didn't stay in there, I was just told there were bad memories in there. About once a month, my mother would go in and dust the room very quickly and then shut the door again until the next dusting. Eileen moved out when I was ten years old. When I was eleven, I asked my parents why I was still living in the smallest bedroom. I wanted the big room. I didn't know the story at the time. I just remembered that they were silent and didn't answer me. Being the pushy lad that I was, I said to them that, since they didn't really have a good reason, then I could move in. My mom told me that my dad and I should spend the night in the room to see how I like it. I said, why do I need dad to help me know if I like it? My dad told me not to be smart with my mother. If that's what she wanted me to do, then that's what I was to do. So my dad and I spent the night in the room. And to no surprise to me, we woke, and the next morning we were well rested. So I moved into the big room. Every morning they both asked me if I slept well and if anything happened. I didn't understand it at the time. Years later, at the telling of the story in Florida, I came to understand that. For eight years, until we moved to the States, I never had a problem in the room. In fact, it was quite the opposite. I felt very comforted in the room. And perhaps this was because Sheila was very close to me as a young toddler, and this closeness carried over to me sharing her room with her. I can't say that everyone else was comforted in my room. I had several friends over to tell me that they thought my house was haunted. Now granted, our house was a big brooding house with dark wood walls and floors. Even with the lights on, there were still many dark corners. However, it was a strange thing. Some friends and girlfriends were both bothered there, others were not and it seems the ones that complained about the place turned out to be not so great of friends or girlfriends, as they were the ones who would turn on me or cheat on me. They often felt taps on the shoulder when no one was there, or would hear whispers or footsteps when we were alone. The ones who were true friends never felt any such thing in my house. I'm going to close out the 2018 Anything Goes Halloween special with a podcast that inspired me to start podcasting, and this was the Haunted New Jersey podcast. It was with Garrett Husfeth, who's no longer with us. Rest in peace, Garrett. Al Robber, who I'm in constant contact with now, and Gordon Ward was in this episode. It's episode 81 from July 3rd of 2009, and it's about a haunted home in Hickory, Pennsylvania. And as you'll hear, they share an EVP from the session that they did in that home. But the uh, EVP isn't very good quality. But the one that follows in the story that they tell afterwards is really creepy. And it's a 25-minute clip of that episode. It's not the whole episode. And I hope you enjoy it. You did an investigation with Dave Manganelli recently, right out in Pennsylvania. Yes, I did. Our our good friend Dave Manganelli. What happened was uh, when... I, when um... You know, whenever anything happens out in Western PA, uh, and I'm called in, I usually ask Dave if he'd like to come along. Um, and he was free, and we did. We did a, uh, a house out in Hickory, Pennsylvania. Now, Hickory, Pennsylvania is a very, very old town. How old? Um, 
I'm going to say it probably dates back to, um, well, it definitely dates back to pre-revolutionary times. Okay. And um, the house, it's, the house itself though is not is not old. It's very new. It's uh, twenty years old. Um, but um, what happened was a friend of mine uh, that I work with has been telling me about her cousin who lives in a house in Hickory, and had been having a lot of experiences in the house. And um, I guess it happens. She just didn't think I'd be interested in going, you know, or I didn't have the time to go. And I said, Yeah, no, I have the time, of course. And um, Dave and I went out there. Um, as I said, Hickory, Pennsylvania, its big claim to fame is every year it has an Apple Festival, mm -hmm. you know, in town, and that's what you know what why Hickory is known. But um, the uh, the the home itself is a beautiful home. Uh, uh, it's a very modern home. It's only about twenty years old, but uh, it sits up on a mountain on, on near the top of the mountain. Uh, although right across the street there's another mountain that's three times as high, you know, which you can see. So it's kind of you know it sits up on a smaller mountain. And uh, it's a gorgeous home, uh, cathedral ceilings downstairs in all the rooms, big pool outside, um, wildlife all over the grounds. Uh, you know, uh, uh, while we were there, a couple of deer just ran past the window and, um, you know, beautiful, beautiful setting. Matter of fact, I, when I walked, when I came, went there, I, I couldn't believe the lawn was so huge and it was going almost straight up a hill. Oh, yeah. And I was saying, how the hell do you mow this lawn, <laughs> you know? And he's got a tractor and he goes up and down. Uh, and I guess and he mows it. You said it's only about 20 years old, the, the house? The house is 20 years old. They've lived there for 11 years. Okay. And the interesting thing was the people who lived there before them um, had apparently had mob connections and mm -hmm. ran numbers, mm -hmm. uh, or a numbers operation. Mm -hmm. um, there wasn't, as far as they, as they knew, there wasn't anything uh, that happened at the house as, as far as anything, um, any killings or murders or anything like that. But... Um, they did say that the family was very violent. That was there before them. Hmm. Um, a lot of fighting, a lot of family fights and things. And, and uh, uh, I think that the uh, I think that the one guy actually ended up in jail. Okay. You know, um, but they got the and and that's how they got the house. The house went into foreclosure. Okay. And uh, so they got it at a really good price. It's a gorgeous house. They have a lot of antiques in the house. Oh yeah. Um, they they came from Seattle and this family and they had owned a bed and breakfast in Seattle. And they brought some of the antiques with them. And uh, so Dave and I went there, and um, most of the activity uh, happens in three different rooms. There's a guest bedroom on the second floor, and then there's, uh, well, actually maybe four, but there's a guest bedroom. There's also a bathroom off the bedroom where um, a, a little girl had gone in, in to use the bathroom and saw an old man mm -hmm. in the bathroom. Mm -hmm. Um, there's, uh, the office downstairs, um, where activity occurs and the master bedroom is, there's a lot of activity in the master bedroom. Okay. Most of the activity is in the master bedroom, which is a, uh, downstairs. And, um, th again, it's a gorgeous place, big cathedral ceilings. I wish there was activity in my master bedroom. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know about that kind, but I, there's a there's paranormal activity in the master bedroom, and uh, the first inkling, the first uh, indication that they got of of things happening was when the real estate agent took them to the house the first time they were there, and they opened the front door and walked in, and they heard somebody running around upstairs back and forth. Oh, the, the initial visit. Yeah, the initial visit, and the real estate person thought somebody else was showing the house. And he yelled out, you know, I'm here to show the house. Is, is everything okay? Uh, a couple times, no answer. Mm -hmm. So he went upstairs looking for, you know, whoever it was. And eventually the step, footsteps stopped when he got up to the top of the yeah, steps. Yeah, of course. And uh, there was nobody there. You know, they couldn't find anybody. But it was very loud. It was very loud uh, footsteps. It, obviously somebody running around upstairs. Um, so right from that time, they suspected that there was something there. But, they, I mean, they didn't. They didn't really put too much into that because it was just an incident that occurred. And like I said, they got the house for a very good price. So um, they jumped on it and they took it. Um, the other things that happened there, um, as I start to say, the her, uh, the niece, her niece, their niece, uh, was there uh, at a Christmas Eve party and very clearly described a very wrinkled, old, bald man like myself uh, <laughs> With a tuft of white hair in the upstairs bedroom, she she saw him and was very frightened and left. Okay, him. wouldn't go back uh, again or doesn't want to go back into the house again. Oh, at all. Right, right. 
Does um, it resemble some, one of the former owners? No. Well, this is another thing now. The, they didn't think, and this is good, um, they didn't think there was ever anything else on those grounds. Okay. Um, there, uh, about the former owners, I don't think it resembled the former owners, but it could have resembled maybe one of their you know, parents, parents or something. Maybe. They yeah. don't have enough information right now, right. and they're they're doing their research right now. Right. Since I've been there, they're um, researching the house and the property to find out what was there. And that's a good point because I asked, well, you know, this house isn't that old. What was here before? And they said, I think it was just all woods. Yeah. Well, then the husband said, well, wait a minute. I just, I've had a well right next door. Oh. There now, if there's a, a well, there had there. to be a house. Yeah. I mean, why would there be a well? Yeah. You yeah. know, there had to be another structure there. A lot of the trend, you know, the trend today is to just knock down whatever's there and build a new one and, right. and, and, and something like that yeah. happen. Yeah. And the well that. is very close to, to their house. So okay. it's not like, it's in the woods, but right. it's very close to their house. So right. Or it's something attached been. with the antiques, you know, came in that way. Well, so that that could also be could be another explanation, yeah. That also could be it, too. Um, and I'm kind of thinking, you know, in those terms, too. Um, other things happened. Uh, they, they had a, a dog who's since passed on, but uh, this dog was a very calm, peaceful dog. But um, a couple of times, this dog just flipped out, mm-hmm. you know, barking and really physically going after something that they couldn't see. Um they were uh, the footsteps again um, in the bedroom, uh, upstairs bedroom. They would be, they'll be downstairs in their room, and they'll hear somebody pacing upstairs. And it's very distinct, very distinct footsteps. Um, some of the, uh, most of the floors are carpeted, but some of them aren't. Okay. And, um, they've had like, they've got like three or four bathrooms. So, you know, each area has ba- has a bathroom. So that's not carpeted. No. You know? that's, and um, they have um, other things that have happened there. Um, they had a woman come to the house who was a psychic. And what happened was her daughter had had, they'd been having all these experiences. And their daughter, their, her daughter was working with a woman who she found out was psychic. But the woman doesn't do this for a living. Um, she doesn't advertise as being a psychic or anything. She just she keeps it quiet, daughter. right? Yes. Yeah. She keeps it quiet. And she went to the house, and she walked into the house, and she said immediately, there's a lot of activity in this house. And she immediately came out with a child. She says, there's a young girl, about four or five years old in the house. There's an older man, and there's a teenager, mm. a boy, teenage boy in the house. And um, Which would link up to the running and the old man seen in the yeah. The old man has been seen, and she's seen a little girl. Who has? The, the owner? The owner. Okay. The owner's seen a little girl. Um any a number did, of times. Any did, did, like period clothing? Could she tell? No, she um, no, she didn't. Mm. Um, she couldn't tell. But um, they have uh, down in the basement. There, there's a uh, air hockey game. Yeah. And she said, "There's been times when she's upstairs, and all of a sudden she hears somebody playing air hockey." Oh, she'll just hear the puck going click, back the and puck, forth, clicking, yeah. clicking, and she'll go running downstairs, and of course nobody's, nobody's there. there. Yeah. yeah. And uh, she's not really spooked by by any of it. I mean, she's she she feels there's something there, but she feels like she can live with it, and she wants to learn mm-hmm. a bit more about is it. Is the air hockey like? Is there a movement? Like, is the the, the puck has it been moved? I don't know. I don't know. She just hears yeah. it, I guess. I don't yeah, know. It'd be interesting to have her like set it up, you know, so she knows right. where the puck is. Even where the circle, puck, yeah, 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 even yeah. mark mark where the stuff is. Mm-hmm. Um, she, um, but she says it, it's very distinct, and it is, you know. Yeah, that air, sound. Yeah, that sound of the air yeah. hockey puck. So um, that's that's going on there. She was in her office one day, and she said she just felt something, somebody playing with her hair, and um, she said she felt like it was a little girl, like just playing with her hair, mm-hmm. you know. And um, another time, she had been in the upstairs bedroom, that's act, the active bedroom, and she was doing something. She closed the door, and uh, she said suddenly the door just started violently shaking as if somebody had the doorknob and was shaking it like, like she had closed somebody in the door okay. or locked somebody in the room. And she, so she immediately opened the door and said, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't realize you were in here, and then waited a, you know, a couple of seconds and then closed the door. Again. And that was, was it. Yeah. That's cool. That was fine, yeah. So that's why she thinks there's a little girl. She's so, pretty sure. She's seen um, kind of like an, an image, um, but she, the way she described it was like a, a golden electrical image of something, mm-hmm. of a little girl. But she's also seen more times an image of the top of a gentleman's head, um, tall gentleman's head. Like the old guy's head? Yeah, yeah. But not his full body. 
No. Yeah. No. No. Not his full body. Um, but what, I, what's the family unit that lives in there? Is there a husband and wife? A, there's a husband, a wife, and a daughter. How old's the okay. daughter? Daughter is uh, about twenty. Uh, I think she's about twenty. I'm just guessing she's about twenty two, twenty three. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Twenty one or something like that. Okay. Um. And so this has been spanned out over the eleven years that they've lived there. Yeah, yeah. activities have been since they've gotten there. It, there's been things happening. So has it been? I guess infrequent then, right? Yeah. Yeah. It, well, it's 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 on and off. Mm -hmm. um, she she said she can't put it into a pattern, but um, like for example, the last thing that happened, this thing with seeing the man, the top of his head, that happens all the time. Oh, really? Yeah. On, on the on like the bottom floor, or first top floor, bedroom. Oh, just in the bedroom, in the second bedroom. floor, where the right. where the niece saw him. No, no, no. The master bedroom's on the first oh, floor, and that's where she sees him. Yeah. Okay, yeah. so he's all over the house. Yeah, she's also been overcome by the scent of cigarettes, mm. and people don't smoke in the house. Mm -hmm. a strong, um, strong cigarette smells. Listen, let's take a break for a second. I know okay. you you did some recording in there. We're going to play a, a voice that you got in there, and mm -hmm. then we have another. Um, all right, you want to get back to the story in Hickory, PA? Yeah, um, there was another incident in the house where um, the woman and her daughter were both in the office working on the, on the computers in the office, and they heard somebody uh, come into the house, and, and the entranceway is right outside the office, come into the house, and she heard footsteps walking um, right outside her office. And they thought that her husband had come home. He had gone to the store. Right. And they said, you know, I kept shouting out, we're in here, we're in here. And the footsteps just kept walking around. And they said, we're in here. And uh, then they opened the door and went out there, and there was nobody there. About 10 minutes later, the husband came home. Um, the interesting thing about this house is that um, the it, it's set pretty far away from the main road. So the electricity coming into the house, mm -hmm. it, it comes in uh, on a long you know, wire, long connection, but the connection is set away from the house. And then apparently they dug under, uh, they dug the rest of the way and they uh -huh. put it under, underground and the electricity comes in, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, in an area that's um, not far from the office. It's actually more by the garage, but it's close to where some of the activity in the upstairs room um, and the, uh, and the office on the other side, where the master bedroom is, there's a condensing unit for a uh, for the air conditioner mm -hmm. sitting right outside that. So you have EMF you know, so fields all a, over, the, huh? You got the fields in the rooms that where there's activity. Um, you certainly have occasions when the fields are very high. Like how high? Do you remember? Uh, well, I mean, when I when I went into the basement, they were over a hundred. I'm, I'm sorry, when I went into the uh, into the garage, they were over a hundred. But that's because you're close to where you know it's coming in. Yeah. Uh, when you get farther away, away it's they're dissipates. not that high. Right. But at certain times, they're going to be. Yeah. You know, well, they fluctuate. Times, well, in the master bedroom, she's got two huge, and I'm talking that size or bigger, two huge uh, plasma TVs in the room. She's got all kinds of. Uh, I, I think they even had a microwave, like, you know, in the bedroom, in the bedroom or right next is to Is the it. master bedroom where the power comes in? No, the master bedroom is, is, the other is side next of the house? to the, yeah, it's the other side of the house is oh, okay. where the power comes in, but the master bedroom is where the condensing unit sits outside okay. for the air conditioner. So that puts out a huge feel too. But I mean, these TVs, when these TVs are on, and she says that's when the stuff seems to happen, like if she's watching a TV show or reading or something, you know, or, or has something on, but she's reading, um, then she'll notice the figure you know the tall figure or, mm -hmm. or the little girl mm -hmm. in the room. so um we did some we did some evp sessions in each of the rooms and we didn't get anything in any of the rooms except for the master bedroom um and i only got one voice yeah and that was it now the interesting thing is dave manganelli didn't get anything and he was he had this uh he had this contraption this this recorder that, uh, I mean, it looked like something out of Star Wars, you know, mm -hmm. it had like, you know, double speaker, double microphones here right. and here and, and all kinds of stuff on it. You know, it was a really pretty neat looking recorder. Uh, but he didn't get anything. I think he was using an analog tape. He didn't get anything, uh, but I did. And Dave sent me a, a letter basically saying he thinks that he, he's got something that sounds like a breath where I have the voice. Right. And uh, But he didn't pick up anything. And I said, Dave, well, that's not unusual that you didn't pick up anything. Because no, you're not supposed to with EVP. Nine out of ten times. Right. Yeah, you're not. Well, do you want to play this? I mean, it's um, it's yeah. it's a, uh, what would you say? It's a B or C voice? I think it's like a C, C. plus maybe. Yeah. Yeah. All right. I'm going to loop it a few times. Okay. 
Hold on one second. Okay, and it was cap. That was captured in the master bedroom. It's like two or three syllables. It's like fifteen decibel boost. Yeah. Yeah, I can't make it. What do you think it says? Well, I think it says either keep it closed or keep it close. Um, the I played it for about six or eight people. I mean, maybe eight or ten people. And most of them say they think it's keep it closed. Keep it closed. Yeah, one or two people said it. it they they heard keep it close. Okay. But I mean, what close or closed? Yeah. I mean, you know. <laughs> close enough. Yeah. And what about you? Want to tell the backstory behind the second voice we have? Uh, yeah. Um, well, the second voice uh, we mentioned this last time. I think. Well, we didn't. <laughs> That um, we've been we've been uh, contacted. I've been contacted and become pretty good friends with a gentleman who's a Fox Radio uh, personality. Uh, his name is Spencer Hughes. So anybody that uh, wants to Google it, Google Spencer Hughes, and mm-hmm. you'll find out when he's on. You can listen to the show. Um, he's on the West Coast, right? Yeah, he's uh, yeah he's on the West Coast um, in California, and uh, he's about two hours uh, about two hours from uh, Oakland area. Of California, and um, he had gotten my name from an old friend of ours, Mary Walters. You remember Mary right. Walters, who uh, was on New Jersey radio for so long uh, at one hundred one point five. Mm-hmm. Um, a good friend of mine, a real dear friend of mine, and she had mentioned me to him when he had talked about things happening in his house. And um, his house is—it's um, not that old. The house is not that old, and he didn't doesn't think that there was anything on the property. Um, before that, but that area of California, chances are there was something there because that dates back. I mean, um, that area of California dates back probably almost as as long as the settlements on the East Coast. Oh, yeah, know? that um, the you know Indians. Yeah, we can't Indians. say where it is. Yeah. yeah, but yeah, we don't want to say the town that it's in, but it's actually uh, it's on the it's coast. A, yeah, it's a very old area of yeah, California. Yeah, and um, but he he'd, he'd been seeing things. Mm-hmm. You know, they'd been seeing things. It was like, I think, three. First, it was three people when he first contacted me who had seen an apparition. Um, one of these glancing apparitions, you know, of a little girl. Mm-hmm. And uh, by the next time he contacted me, it had gone up to about eight people that had seen it. So it's pretty active. Mm. Um, I had suggested he try to do some taping. And the first tape he ran, first time he ever ran a tape, um, he sent it to me before he listened to it. And. Uh, or I guess right after he listened to it, and he heard dragging on the tape. Well, when he sent it to me, it was only about a two-minute segment. I think I pulled off about eight voices. Oh, really? Yeah, I sent it to you guys. Oh, Remember? those were some of those voices yeah. you sent. That's yeah. right. Okay, yeah. yeah. I mean, they're freaky, all different mm-hmm. voices, you know, and, and a number of different voices on there. And uh, so I sent it back to him, and it says, uh, you know, I hate to tell you, but I think you got a lot of stuff going on in your right. place. And um, so he, uh, we talk maybe twice or three times a week now, he calls. I tried to set up uh, with Lloyd to go there because uh, Lloyd's much closer. Lloyd's only two hours away. And um, and he, want, it was, he promised me he would go there, but he hasn't had time yet. He's mm-hmm. been doing this project on San Francisco Ghost and stuff. Okay. So he hasn't been able to get down there yet, but uh, hopefully he will because I didn't want, what I didn't want was, you know, Spencer to contact the local ghost club. Ghost Club, yeah, yeah, yeah you know, um, you know, with the psychic who, you know, sees demons. I didn't, I didn't want that. You know, I wanted him to go to somebody reputable, and he actually had heard of Lloyd. He had read his books, right? Some of his books, and he was like, "Oh, wow!" You mean, you know, Lloyd Auerbach says, "Yeah, we know him. You know, known him for a long time." Anyway, so he, uh, well, I set it up with Lloyd. He hasn't gotten there yet. But um, since then, Spencer has been reading everything I tell him to read about the, yeah. about the subject, and he's, he's great. And he's uh, um, unfortunately he's also tending to go on on the internet and find some wacky groups out there too. Uh, and he's asking me a lot of questions, which I'm glad he is. And uh, I'm trying to help him out. I'm trying to. You know, it's frustrating to... for people that want to hook up with yeah. reputable people because there aren't just aren't a lot. Not anymore. No, there just aren't. But um, he's doing a good job, and he's running. He, he's doing things that I asked him not to do. But he's also uh, running a, lo- a lot of tapes at night, and um, he's sent over a couple of voices. 
Uh, one that is really freaky. We're having a problem with it. We, as a matter of fact, you, you have just the one I have. Yeah, yeah. you've had. You know, we reversed it, and it actually makes more sense reversed than right. it does. Which can happen. Uh, which can happen. Um, he's um, he sent me two more today that I didn't get a chance to even two more tape segments that I didn't even get a chance to listen to mm-hmm. yet. Uh, is he using an analog tape? Uh, he's uh, no, he's got a uh, an, uh, he just bought an Olympus uh, digital digital. Okay. Yeah, he was also he was using some type of a uh, pretty I think a pretty good video tape. Okay, a video uh, you know mm-hmm. uh, machine too. So um, I think he was getting stuff on there. But the weird one of the weird things in this it all seems to be happening in the same room, mm-hmm. which is a living room. And the, the house is only twenty years old. The house is not that old. Yeah. yeah. Uh, is that it, he gets this dragging sound on the tape, and you can hear it clear as day. There's dra- something being dragged. It's not audible by the ear, human ear, though, right? No. Yeah. And it's always in, around. The, it's always right around the mic. Mm-hmm. It always seems like it's around the the recorder. Mm-hmm. You know, it seems that close. Uh, but I mean, people sleep in the living room too, so this is tough. You know, he's got sometimes his, his little girl sleeps there, or the baby sleeps there, or his little girl or him. Does he vary where he puts the recorder? I don't know. Hmm. I don't know, but. Um, He's getting so much stuff that I'm really seriously toying with the idea of going out there for yeah. a weekend. You know, just, just spend to, the weekend there, just to try to you know um, see if we can make sense of what what's down there. But yeah, he sent a, uh, he sent over um, a voice the other day, and it freaked him out. He was listening to he what he did was he uh, it was this I think this was on analog tape. Okay, I believe this was because he told me yeah this one was captured on analog tape because he told me that he. Um, he, he took the tape and threw it in his car to listen to as he was in traffic, you know, in California traffic so terrible while well, he's sitting in traffic uh, after he did his show. And, uh, and this thing, he said, made the hair stand up on his neck, this well, voice. They're seeing a little girl on there, and this sounds like an old woman. Yeah, this sounds like an old woman. Um, now, I'm going to play it the way he pulled it off the tape, and then we'll reverse it and play okay. it. Good. All right, hold on a sec. It's right, right in here. Let me really loop it. Is that the way he pulled it off the tape? Right. I'm gonna raise it a little bit. Okay. And he thought it was maybe a foreign language, that, but that usually doesn't happen. All right. Sorry for the hum, everyone, too. It's just something's wrong. Well, what do you hear? I hear listen something. You know what I hear? What? I hear something like, please do it. My heart's broke. I have no idea what it's saying. All right, well, I'm going to run it the other way. Yeah. Let me reverse it. The other way, I think we could pick off a couple words. And I hear where you get the love is tame at the uh, end. I'm hearing it's not love is tame. All right, I'm going to raise it to like 10 dB. Okay. I don't know, but it's definitely a voice, in my opinion, your opinion. Yeah, I think your it's opinion. A, I think it's a voice. I think it's an older person, an yeah. older woman or something. Yeah, to me it sounded like it's not love is tame, but that doesn't make any sense. No, but sometimes they don't. Yeah, a lot of times they don't. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, if it's a thought projection, a lot of the thoughts I think don't make any sense either. No, you're right. You know, you're right. it's thought. Yeah. I kind of, I kind of, again, I don't know enough about, and he's just, again, he's just getting into this. He's just, uh, he asked me where he can get some information about the property, and I just, of course, sent him down to the local library or mm-hmm. the local um, town, town hall right. know, to um, look at some of the old records and see what was there, so look at the old property records. Um, and he's just starting to get into it, so... Um, he's very interested now in the field, um, especially since he's living in, you know, what happens to be a perfect environment. Mm-hmm. Learn about it, and um, I'm just hoping that he keeps his feet on the ground and doesn't get um, 
doesn't get sucked into one of you know sucked into something. one of these metaphysical yeah. cult ghost hunting groups. Exactly. Thank you. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, you know, I don't. Uh, I'm hoping he doesn't uh, end up. Uh, you know, putting ah, uh, he can do whatever he wants, but I hope he does doesn't get too religiously involved with it. No. You know, you know what I mean? No. Like they'll like some people will tell him to do. Yeah. Do you have anything else that you want to talk about? We have, those are both good stories. I really like the one in Hickory, Pennsylvania. It's just a lot of stuff going well, next on. Next time you come out, we'll, I'll set we'll, something we'll up. We'll go over there. Yeah. I hope you enjoyed the 2018 and Anything Ghost Halloween. That's all I have for this year. But I have several stories 